today, what I'd like to do, and maybe next week I'd like to do, is something I don't get to do so much. I'd like to learn the posture together um, and learn some um, meditations, not really meditation, like learn some teachings in the posture. Maybe we'll make a, a meditation out of it, time permitting. So I love to go to a, 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 one of our favorite works. It's so easy when people say, I've never learned Chassidus before. I'd like something light and easy, especially with the Shayidin, who are a little insecure about learning something deep. And then the Siva Shalom is such a wonderful, such a wonderful source of beautiful Torah, simple, easy to read, with all the focus in the right places, and Das and Debekas, Tik and Amidas, talking in the most simple, beautiful, elegant way. And I want to learn something very beautiful, very special today together that he talks about in the Pasha. And some of it is familiar terrain that we've discussed before and to see how he brings it together is very, very beautiful. Um, and some of it is uh, is uh, talking about something that I, I try usually not to talk about at all. Um, but what can I tell you? It's part of the it's part of the Torah portion this week. So we should talk a little about what the bris is and what the middle of your soil is and what the how that's connected to Das. These are very fundamental teachings in Hasidus and Kabbalah and Torah. So we'll spend a little time on it. So in this week's Torah portion, and learn something a little deep. So the Nesivis Shalom begins teaching us a little about the mitzvah of bris milah, the mitzvah of circumcision. And he speaks about it on a level that we like to understand these things on, not as a metaphorical idea, but on the shift that it has in consciousness and how it's actually connected to consciousness itself. In the previous Torah that we're not going to get to, Torah base, when we talk about Torah Gimel today, so we know in this week's Pasha, we find that Abraham, Avram Avino, has just had the bris miller. He's just been commanded to have the bris miller. And Hashem appears to him in the name Shaddai. His halech lefanai v'haya tamim. You should walk before me and you should be tamim, wholesome, pure. Whatever that means, we'll discuss that a little. And the common... Taters say that walking before him in this context means means a lot of things. Halach de bedrachav means to go to And in this context, it means do the bris melda, do the circumcision. So our sages talk about a lot of fascinating shifts that happen in Abraham's consciousness as a result of tikkun of the bris. And it, it shifts his consciousness and it shifts all human consciousness. And, and the tikkun of the bris I would like one day to do a whole series of classes on this subject because it's profoundly, profoundly deep. And it's all about the middle of your soid. In fact, the Hashem appears as Shaddai because Shaddai, which we have on the mezuzahs, is also about the, the, the middle of your soid. Shaddai is the divine name that refers to your soid in the world of Itzilis. Hmm. It's also interesting because Shaddai is on the mezuzahs. We have been putting up the mezuzahs in the house for a long time now, it's trying to get certain things right. And we have Shaddai on uh, on the mezuzahs because we're transitioning from one world, from one doorway to another. And the Yisoid is, is uh, the, the mitzvah mezuzah is up, is basically placed a third down from the top and that's a third down from the top of the doorway. And this is a whole deep thing in the Kit Ve'eri. This is the, 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 the mid of Yesoid, how Yesoid moves into Malchus. So we'll, we'll try and explain some of these things as we go. I don't know if we're going to spend so much time on mezuzahs. But when we first meet our hero, Abraham, he's, in, uh, he's out away from home. He's staying in the tent in the field. He's described as being in uh described as being sitting in the doorway in the boiling hot sun he's waiting to greet the three angels that come towards him um he's on the third day after the bris miller the third day is considered the most painful day 
<laughs> and he has a vision of Hashem. Hashem comes to him in, in an incredible vision. And uh, Abraham is uh, almost a chutzpedic, if we could say, not really. Abraham, you know, Hashem calls him on the phone and says, I'm doing Biko Cholim. I heard you're not feeling well. And Abraham says, sorry, I'm a little busy. I'm, there's some random Arabs walking through the neighborhood. I'm just going to chat with them rather than talking with you, Hashem. So this is a kind of a fascinating interaction. And our sages from the Talmud say that Hafnas's Ochim, to bring guests in, to greet guests, is greater than being the Kabbal, the Pnei Shechina, than speaking to Hashem. So that's also very deep things to explore. But the Nasir Shalom and other Siddiquim as well, are focusing on the nature of Abraham's revelation and that his revelation changes in quality completely from the revelations he had before the bris to the revelations he has after the bris. Aviva, I don't know if you own the Nasir Shalom. Do you own the Nasir Shalom, Aviva? I need to double check with my husband. Uh, it's possible. Fine. So you should get in the Siva Shalom in this week's Pasha, the first Halak of Beratius, and you should check Torah base because he talks a lot about the body moving and the body shaking and how that's the first level of revelation we speak to Hashem as the body responds. But then when we purify our midas in a certain way, as you have to look back in the previous Torah, then, then we can reveal Hashem and experience Hashem without the body shaking and moving. So you may, I know that's something that you're part of your journey. So you may find that fascinating to learn on the inside and see a little of what he says there. So you look into that. Um, it's very interesting because uh, he brings down the Rambam, Maimonides, in Perik Zion of Hilchus Yisrael Torah, says, in Avia Milas Milas Hay, many, many prophets, there's no such thing as you're a prophet or you're not a prophet. There's many different levels of prophets and prophecy. Kamoshi Yesh, Bechachma, just like in, in wisdom, some people are smarter than others, and therefore some of the prophets were greater and lower. And all of them, when they prophesied, their limbs would shake, their body would shake, and the and the the koyach haguf kashel, and the the strength of their body would fail. Their body would just be like overwhelmed, and their minds would just be. I don't know, shattered, how would you say that? They'd become overwhelmed. And therefore, and all of that was taking them down. They would fall on the floor, which would leave their pure consciousness with the shehad das, penui lahavin mashatira, so that, that the external part of the mind is overwhelmed and the body falls on the floor and the whole being is shaking and is consuming all the, the body's energy basically fails, they collapse on the floor. But then the consciousness is free, basically, to focus on the divine and have that experience. And it says that Avam Avinu, before the bris, in a gadoila and the of love, he would always collapse when he had these visions. This this fear and darkness and overwhelming nature would cause his body to collapse. That was all before he was circumcised. Like it says in Rashi, Abraham Abraham would fall on his face every time the Shekhinah Ruch HaKodesh would dwell upon him. So he wasn't, his body wasn't able to handle the revelation. It's very interesting you see in, in, in um, people do deep breath work seminars. You see when people work with psychedelics today, you see all the, the body moves and it shakes and it has pins and needles and it collapses and you see all that kind of work. Um, and uh, what our sages are teaching, what the Maimonides is teaching us, is that it's because they can be given a gift of revelation as part of their tikkun, as part of their process, it's called the life of the godless, as part of whatever healing they need, as Hashem can appeal, appear to them, but it can only be done in a way where the whole system collapses below it because the body is not pure and ready and holy enough that it can stand and the, the lower consciousness can't handle the revelation of the light because the lower consciousness is the ego consciousness and the ego consciousness is the opposite of divine consciousness. But the more we purify our lower consciousness, the more we purify uh, 
a heart and a body that's called ruach nemucha the the nefesh shefela then the more that the body and the mind the conscious mind can stand with the revelation because our lower self is not a contradiction to our higher self so it says yipala vaham alpanav memoria shkhina shad shlo mo la haya boy kuyah la mod bu ruach kodesh net service alav vezesh nama babilam so only only in certain times that that's what would happen with Bilam as well because Bilam was so spiritually impure when he would get prophecy um you know he couldn't handle the, the, the he couldn't take it up like Moshe Rabbeinu had the ability that he would just turn to Hashem and ask a question and turn back and there was no whole process because he was so elevated in his lower self not just his self in his lower self that his lower self could ascend and not eat and drink for 40 days his lower self was was living in the spiritual realm. It's fine. So he's going to begin by telling us something very very fascinating indeed that Abraham before he circum was circumcised would always collapse and would always be overwhelmed by fear and his body would shake like all the lower prophets. But after the Bruce Miller he could have a level of divine revelation a prophecy but he would have that with shlaima sadas he would be what's called a tamim he would be pure and united and whole his lower self and his higher self were in a state of wholeness and completed completeness if you will so what he's going to talk a little about is what is the bris what is this circumcision what is this covenant that it affects our capacity for revelation. I mean a bris miller is I don't want to get graphic at all but if miller is a, a kind of edit that we do on the body. But the edit that we do on the body has very powerful spiritual transformational energy that shifts the entire person's consciousness and of course it is it is energetically it has a physical effect on the physical body. but it is kabbalistically and energetically transformative and there's also a thing called the olis halev and the bris halev which we've discussed before right we discussed in the rebbe nachman series that just as we circumcise our body we also have to circumcise our heart and these two things are deeply connected so these are things that that the the biggest sedikim spoke deeply Rabbi Nachman has something called the Tikkun Haklali because he said now I'm going to just you know I I some people think talk, think I talk about this too, stuff too much as far as I'm going to I never really talk about this stuff in depth at all but today I feel for some reason compelled to talk about it a little but this is not my stuff this is this is all the stuff think Rabbi Nachman Tikkun Haklali Tikkun Haklali means when a person would spill seed it's one of the most destructive and damaging energetic things a person can do to their consciousness and their soul to spill their seed willfully and he created something called the he reveals something called the tikkun haklali tikkun haklali means that it fixes everything it's an all purpose healing an energetic healing So it's very interesting to look like I mean you fixed you a person made a touch a terrible mistake going after their eyes after the heart after which they stray and then and then they they fix that so they don't they they try and undo the damage of all the negative energy that caused but why is that taking a cloud it's it's fixed the bris so the answer is that when we fix our bris and we heal our sexual desire our sexual energy there is no greater damaging force to human consciousness and there's no greater elevating force of human consciousness is the purification of sexual energy so the 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 ultimate perfection of abraham came with the bris which changed on every level his capacity to experience divine revelation so this is an interesting connection to explore a little today what is the connection to that why is that the tikkun haklali and this is d- deeply connected to all the work that we we do with das and all the things we've discussed here so i'm going to begin in reading a little and we're not going to spend much time inside i just want to read 
two kind of uh, paragraphs, and then we'll, we'll talk about the rest of the ideas on the outset. Any questions or clarifications before we begin? Oid. Yeshlama, the Hine, Indian mitzvahs hamila. The, 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 the concept of the mitzvah, of the Torah imperative to do the, the mitzvah, the, the mila. Shalaya amma hakodesh baruchu la avaham, his halech lafanai vahaya tamim. This mitzvah, which is given to Abraham with the words, his halech lafanai, walk before me. These are very interesting term, walk before me, Bahaye tamim, and be pure and be whole and be elevated and be perfect and be wholesome. So first of all, there's a mitzvah called Bismillah. And second of all, when it's given to Abraham, it's given in this interesting term, his halech lafanai, vahaya tamim. What's, why is the Bismillah walking before Hashem? And what is this result where, where it gets you to be tamim? In Yana, the essence of this mitzvah, she'al yedezeh, higia avam avino, litikun hagamo shal midas hadas. Through doing the mitzvah of this milah, Abraham, our forefather, finally completed and perfected his das, his consciousness. So das is something that is that I've said many times before, is, is the Yisoyed, the Shavash of everything, we learn elevation is taken a das. So he, fixing and healing the destructive sexual energy is what allowed Abraham to finally complete his consciousness. He Shavash Midas Yisoyed, who b'moyach hadas k'yadua. Okay. Now, depends how we all wanted to understand this in our learning. Are we willing to understand this in a level of consciousness? I hope so. Are you ready to understand this in the level of Sfirat, on a Kabbalistic level? Some of you are more interested in that. Some of you are less interested in that theory. So we'll try and do a little of both. The Sharish of Midas Hadas, of Midas Yisoid, who Moya Hadas Kiyadua. Okay, there are 10 Sfirat. Are we good with that so far? Right. And the top half, we have Keta, Chochma, Bina, and Das. Yes, I know there's a 10 and an 11, but for argument's sake. We have the crown, higher consciousness. We have expanded awareness of Kachma. We have the intellectual, ra rational, analytical mind. And then we have the Das, which takes all of the above and brings it into the true me, the true self. Fine. And then that goes out to Chesed, Gevorah, to Ferris, to love, to fear, to balance and harmony. Then it moves out to Netzach, Choyd, Yesod. Fine. In Kabbalah, the middle of sexual energy, of connective energy, is the middle of Yesod. So on the, on the Tselem El Kim, on the breakdown of the ten Sfirot, which are aligned with the mind, the right arm, the left arm, Teferis is the torso, Netzach is the right leg, Choyd is the left leg, and the middle of Yesod is the sexual organs within the man and the woman. So... We've said before a thousand and one times that the meaning of life, the purpose of life is perfection of consciousness, of the mindful aware consciousness called Das. And then there's the intellectual, rational, and then there's the emotions of love and fear, right? And then there's the mice, the malchus of action. But all the way down the body, there's a mitra called Yesoid of sexual energy, of connective energy. So if you've never realized this before, it's fascinating because our sages always compare the middle of your soid to the middle of consciousness. Why should it be? What's the connection that if I fix my soid, then I fix my consciousness? So this is what gets interesting. Nobody says if I fix my love, I fix my das. If I fix my fear, I fix my das. If I fix my ego, I fix my das. So of course we do say those things, okay? We say if you overcome your desires, Fix your das. If you overcome your fear and your trauma, you fix your das, of course. But all of those are individual elements which are necessary to perfect my consciousness. But only a soid is called tikkun haklali. If you fix your sexual energy, then you've perfected all of your consciousness. That's interesting, number one. Number two, it happens to be that your soid is 
amidaklali, it's actual power. The word soid actually means to gather the forces together. It's interesting. The soid actually, the word soid, soid safed kodesh means that the angels all gathered together. They all united, came together as one. So in Kabbalah, your soid is actually a super mida, a super svira. Chesed Gevura to Ferris Netzer Choid are five separate forces. And the power of your soid is it actually brings them all together into a channel and then channels them into Malchus. So it's power. What is the property of your soid? It's twofold. Are you ready? Is this, I hope I haven't lost anyone yet. We're speaking simply, but to the point. Your soid, thumbs up from Ricky. Ricky's good, everybody's good. Yesoid's power is it takes everything before it and brings it together as one. And then it channels that energy through to the feminine, to the vessel. So there's two things it's doing. It's bringing, uniting everything together before. And then, and then it's connecting to another and channeling that to the other. Where love is about the feeling of love, and fear is about the feeling of fear, and Tafaris is about the feeling of ego, right? And Netzach is, do I want to give that or do I want to give that to myself? But you soda is now taking all of those, boiling them, doing them. what is the essence, what is the united power all, and saying, now let's take that beyond the self, beyond the self. It's the self that moves beyond self. Okay. So your soid has two properties. So now you understand this clally. It's It really is the sum accumulation of all that came before, particularly the emotions, but actually everything. And then it connects and bonds. It moves out beyond itself. And then bonds and connects and channels to another. Now let's double back for a second. When Avraham Avinu was metak and fixed and healed, the middle of your sword through the bris, then he finally perfected his das. He was able to live in pure, pristine, divine awareness. What happened after Abraham did his bris? Hashem appeared to him. So that's das, that you are aware of the divine in all moments in all places. How did he have to heal himself? He had to fix his bris. He had to attack in the source of sexual energy within us. Now, next level. If you imagine the spirit, you have chokma, bina, das. Watch this again. Chokma, right. Bina, left. Das, in the center. You have Chesed, Gevura, Teferis, Netzah, Choid, Yesoid. So Yesoid is from the central column. Chochma, abstract, non-dual, unified awareness, Bina, fragmentation, breakdown, details. Das unifies the two and brings them together and synthesizes the two. Love and fear and harmony of the two. Netza, Choid, Yesoid harmonizes the two and actually harmonizes everything above it and then moves that into Malchus, who's also to the center to receive it. So you, you see, so to speak, that there's a line that's drawn, literally a line that's drawn in Kabbalah from, from Das all the way down to Yesoid because it's the central point. The central point is it's what Das is you doing above to, to, the, to the minds, to the consciousnessness, to the Ketachach Mabina. Your soid is doing below. What Das is doing above to the mental faculties, your soid is doing below. Now that's very abstract. Now let me help make this very simple for you. What is the core property of Das? We've discussed an elevation for a long, long time, many properties of DAS. A core property of DAS, my friends, 
first of all, it is the self that unifies all the beliefs and all the feelings and all the senses and all the strengths and all my weakness. I am the, it's the witness. Da, to know, if I flip around, is the letters A, the witness. It is the witnessing self of the mind, of the thoughts, of my beliefs, of my fears, of my joys, of my potential. That means it's, it's outside the system, but it can take everything in. And then what it does, it connects. So we've talked about before, the power of Das is his kashvis and his chavris, right? The power of my, what Das does in consciousness, the genitalia does in the body, in physicality. Mm. We're talking about very holy things. We're going into an area that has for Khalila can be crude. And we're, we're trying to elevate our consciousness, exactly the point of what we're speaking about. We are to think about these bechinas, but in a very high and pure way. Chas v'chila, should be no negativity. We're not doing this to be chas v'chila sensational or chas v'chila in any, any negative way. Just to understand the depth that we've spent literally years exploring what das is. So it would be remiss of us not to talk about the relationship between the soy and das. It's in this week's Pasha. It's in all the chasidas as far I'm talking on this exact nakuda. What we say in elevation is when I'm in Chachma, I'm just one with all of reality. When I'm in Bina, I'm rationalizing and analyzing. I'm talking to you and I'm, I'm you know, I'm thinking about, well, look at their issue, look at their problem, but what's the challenge going for? How are they going? Where are they up to? I'm gathering information and data. I'm trying to understand, but they said this, but do they really mean this? I'm in the intellectual mind. But when we do Das, when I'm in Das, when two people in Das together, my mind is open and clear. I am listening and resonating, and I can feel one with you. When I'm in Das, I can feel one with the words of prayer. When I'm in Das and connected to a sadhak, I am bonding and uniting with them. Because there's no ego in the way. There's no noise in the way. I'm not rationalizing and analyzing you. I'm not up in the world of Devakas. I'm fully clear and present and conscious and aware with what we've learned is called Hakara Hagasha a felt sense of what I'm directly experiencing. That is intimacy of consciousness, if you understand what I'm saying. It's a bonding with another through pure consciousness and awareness. That which the mid of your soul, the genitalia of the body is the physical bonding of one and another together. So this is why the word das is synonymous with the word intimacy. And like the Pasuk says, and Adam knew Eve in a biblical sense. The word for intimacy, which is done with the genital, with, with, done with yesoid, is the same as the word das. It's very fascinating. Rivka, it says, was a basula. She was a virgin. No man had known her, known her, Das. So first Das collects, witnesses. These are my feelings. These are my beliefs. I'm going to synthesize my beliefs. That's a contradiction. I'm going to sense who I am. And here's all my feelings. And one of my heart really saying that. So I, I collect and I connect head and heart, I connect and unify all different parts of me, but then I bond with another, then I communicate with another, then I become one with another in thought, in, in respect, in listening, in awareness. What Das is doing in consciousness, Yesoid is doing in physical expression. You understand the depth of the word of our sages? When they like in the spilling of the seed, no, not even the spilling of the seed, the, the channeling of seed in a holy way is cut. The seed is sourced in the brain and the mind of the father, is what they say. There's part of the consciousness in the seed which goes into the child that becomes the core of the child. Because what's in the asoid is coming from the mirrors, is coming from the das, is coming from the chakmas being, is coming from the keta. So it really is a part of the consciousness of the soul that's then channeled down and transitioned to the other, to the malchus, to the nook. 
So here's the key point I just want you to get so far. What the DAS does in consciousness, the soy does in physicality. It draws and collects all the energies that come before it. And it bonds and connects to another in a way that they can be transitioned to the other. Das literally means yesoid. In Hebrew, they're literally the same words. That's the interesting part. And they both come from the word that means to con collect and connect. That's it, to collect and to connect. It's literally the words. Both of them are the same words. Western Kodesh is an unbelievable language. It's just to see all these is conceptually identical models embedded in the terminology itself. Therefore, Das is the root of our trauma, because just as I can bond with my consciousness towards love and respect and goodness and Siddiquim and Torah and Shabbos and Tefillah and Malachim and Elamas and Sviris and the Orain Saf, I can also bond with my consciousness to destructive energetic forces. Everything that I look at, there's there's many things in halakha that's asa to look at. It's asa to think about because not just because they're bad for our thoughts and bad psychologically, is they're bad energetically because what you put your gas on is the energetic root of which you bond with and which you draw that energy to you. It's quite fascinating. The person has to be very, very careful with these things. And I don't want to say this, and I don't, I just want to hint to this. It's enough. What it means to live with to me, Ms. Kai, to live a life where where intimacy, physical intimacy is done consciously, with purity, with dedication, with with love, with marriage, right? which is saying, who is this soul and what am I bonding with? And what am I, the love and the respect and the commitment and the, the, the building a life together with Kedush and Tahara versus, and I'm not attacking anyone, not judging, but we're just talking about certain spiritual truths versus I bond with anything, with anybody at any time, without consciousness, without care, without dedication, without commitment. And as we said before, that that sticks with us part of each other stays together even people i will never meet again and 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 this is even more intense obviously if i must say it when it becomes physical when there's a bonding in the physical there's a there's a binding of destructive energies even more so than the the, the relatively subtle world of consciousness of course, you can see this, you can play the opposite, that even consciousness is even more risky because it's even more subtle and even more energetically open. But fine. Okay. Let's come back to what we're saying so far. This is only three or four lines in the, the, the Siva show. We're unpacking together. In Yonish, al yidei zeh hegiya avam avino letikon hagamo shal midas adas. Through the bris mila, through doing that act of circumcision, taking off the foreskin and the other steps are part of that process. He perfected his consciousness to the degree that his body was so pure that the divine revealed to him all the time. Even the biggest struggles of life, there was consistently divine revelation to him. That's what the Sibir Shalom is going to go on to say shortly. He sure as mid as Yesod who b'moyachadas, the root of Yesod, the root of the of the mid of the sort of the sphere of your sort of the genitalia etc of that energy of sexual energy is deeply connected and bonded with consciousness because the sexual energy of your soid is actually the lower physical expression 
of what das is in the higher world, to what das is in consciousness. And that's why by Adam Yoda et Chava, the word for das is the same word for sexual union. Okay, so then, then, then we're going to move on a second. Fine. Let's everyone do an emotional check-in in the box. How are you going? Is this making sense? What are you getting from this? Have I lost you? Are you still with me? Give me one or two lines. At the same time, my friends, if you have a question or clarification, please keep your questions on subject. Don't say, well, now you're talking about this. This makes me think of something else that happened last week. Let's learning a more subtle, sensitive subject. Let's let's keep questions just to clarifying that we all understand together what we're speaking about and the ramifications in of themselves. Yes, we're both. Maybe a quick question. So uh, obviously on the physical level, the bris mila is, is for the man for the man only. Now, how about for the woman? Is there something analogous to her or is she on a higher uh, physical level that she does not require one? Yes, well, she's at a higher physical level and therefore it takes place in her heart. The of the bris of the woman is the heart because she's on that level of a man. The woman has more struggles with the heart than the man has with the heart. So. So yes, that, that's where a lot of her work is to be done there. And, and, and being very cautious about talking about this stuff. Okay, I want to say this and I, I don't at all want to say this. I'm going to say it very simply and some people will agree and some people will disagree and it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, sexual desire and destructive sexual desire is much more a male issue than a female issue right i'm not going to bring proofs for that there's enough proofs involved saying words that i don't like to say subjects i don't like to go into now doesn't mean women do not also fall deep in this area of course they do of course they can shatter themselves a million times over but there's many proofs for anyone that deals with with shalom bayish, with marriages, with couples, anyone that knows what happens with addiction, anyone knows all these kind of things. The force is more stronger with men because men have more of the energy about this. And that's, that's very deep things about that. There's very deep things about the nature of a man that it's his job to proactively procreate and channel energy and channel seed. And the truth is that Hashem wants intimacy more with Klai Yisrael than Klai Yisrael wants with Hashem. And that's the root of it. Hashem is always ready to channel his energy and Shefa. But we are the woman. We have our times of month when we're on, when we're Kadash and Taho, when we're Tame, when we sometimes we want it and sometimes we don't want it. Sometimes we want to be with Hashem and Holy and sometimes we want to forgive me for saying sleep with somebody else. We want to go after our desires, after our heart, after our lust. I'm so traumatized. I don't want to speak to my husband, the Shem, right now. But so, just like a woman waxes and wanes, but a man is is often more intensely focused and ready. And that and that's Novemis is something very deep above and the Olamis that that the 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 chef of the Shpoas are. are, are Ra does not come down from Shemayim, is is what the mystics say. That, that the blocks are coming from below. But Hashem wants to be Mishpiyatav from above. Again, it doesn't mean that that doesn't happen with women. It doesn't mean that men sometimes aren't into that or don't want that. Of course, all those things are true because everything is his, his callous. Every There's a masculine within the feminine, a feminine within the masculine, all 100% good and wonderful and fine. But in this Nakuda, in this Nakuda, there is a stronger power and a more destructive nature. Clearly, 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 anyone looking at the Western world with their eyes open. That, that that's around the male with this issue. And the women's issue is more about the heart in, in love and relationship and marriages. When you deal with couples and you deal with relationships, many, many, many times you hear that the man wants more in that area and the woman is struggling. She also in the moment, she wants more love and more caressing and whether it's more romantic or more presence and caring and communication and and you know he's judged because he's just more about the physical thing it doesn't mean a man doesn't also want emotional connection it doesn't mean a woman doesn't also want physicality there of course all these things are also true but there's patterns and the patterns are there for a reason so with this idea you see 
when the man wants to express himself physically, he needs to learn. <laughs> Again, the Gadol, he needs to often learn to help build her and, and open her with love and connection and, and, and build that trust. Because you see, the man is trying to work through physical elements. The woman's trying to build emotional elements. That's because a man is more in the mind and in the spiritual world. And therefore, his the reason, again, these are very deep things. Uh, Bark, if you just turn off your mic for a second, just so I can finish this. Um, sure. It's a, a men are often criticized for being more physically focused. You know, they want their women to look beautiful. Every man ideally would like to marry a supermodel. Every Hollywood actress always says, you know, I have to have plastic surgery and look beautiful because if I'm not looking like a 20 year old beautiful woman, then I'm not wanted in, in films anymore. But why it's not fair that. Harrison Ford can be 97 years old, but he's still cast in, in movies. But once a woman's past a prime. So, so okay, we can blame Hollywood, we can blame the patriarchy, but these are very deep Kabbalistic things. Men are more focused on physicality. Women are more focused on charisma. I'm talking Hollywood movie stars. But what that translates is men are more focused on externality and women are more focused. I, I want, you know, of course, a woman also wants an attractive man. I'm not saying they don't. But a woman, if has a beautiful, loving connection and and deeper inner meaning, is more likely to accept a less attractive man. So right, and some men are more like, but I need it to be beautiful, and, and I can't do that. That of course, the man just needs to grow up and be a man and work through his stuff, right? We're not. I'm not. I'm not saying that isn't true. But there's a very deep core here, a Kabbalistic core. And the Kabbalistic core is men are by nature more spiritual. That means more abstract, means more into potential and vision and ideas. And women are more na more naturally in their body. They are more naturally grounded, more naturally practical. Yes, there are men who are very physical. Yes, there are women who are more right, theoretical, abstract, fine. But there are patterns there. That means because a man is in Shemayim, his, his tikkun comes from having to be physical. He's above, so to speak, if I can use the word above, I'm not sure that's right. But even in intimacy, this is the Kabbalistic truth. So his focus is, I am potential and I am looking for manifestation. I am looking for our things beautiful, physical, practical and harmony because he's less comfortable in the physical world. He, he's less comfortable and he feels that, you know, he wants to come to that full expression, that revelation, that manifestation, because he feels he feels a man in the physical world feels this is not his home. He's out. Men don't want to build a home. A woman wants to build a home because he's practical. He's in the physical world. She's in her heart. She's in her body. And a woman feels that she's in her heart and she's in her body, but she's looking for that Superman, that hero who's going to come out of the sky and pick her up. She's a small girl in a small town and in comes the guy on the motorbike, you know, and he comes in. And so it's the outsider coming in and can lift her up. Um, I always say, I read the biography of Steve Jobs and I always thought it was like, it made me laugh out loud. There's one of his earlier um, partners who was like so in love, he was such a visionary and so ahead of the time, you know, kind of changed the world. But her fantasy was begging him, why can't he come away with her? And they just have a little hut in somewhere in France. They just live together. And there's like, that's the kind of the ultimate female kind of Kabbalistic fantasy, which is I fall in love with the superhero with the superpowers, but then he comes down to earth for me. He gives it away for me, right? But she wants something much greater than her, but she wants to trap it in the house. Um, and ultimately that's a man's biggest fear as well. So why are we talking about this idea? Because this is this idea of sexual bonding, of union, of coming down to bond with the physical world is and the desire to do that is it says I am far away. And this is what brings me to the world. A man needs that desire because this is what brings him to the relationship. This is what brings it because the nature of a man, as you see today, where unfortunately men have been given this is. If, if they don't need to commit, why would they commit? If they don't need to build a home, why would they, if they can get all the benefits without all of the responsibility, then why bother? 
and this shatters women because then women have to give away something that they they feel is is very is the most precious of all things to get that relationship and then they don't get the relationship either um so these are very some of the most core challenging things so in summary the bris the nature of energy sexual energy is what draws what draws the divine highest spiritual energy what compels it to want to be manifesting in the physical world otherwise it would detach otherwise it detach so that force has to be compelling the man to be in 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 the marriage in a relationship the, the the worst marriages i've seen in the worst condition is when intimacy because of the arguments they had they just stopped intimacy six months ago two years ago and that happens and it's just devastating because the man has no reason to be emotionally present and again and the woman feels she can't trust can't open she doesn't want to give there anymore she right and there, and therefore that that shatters things and it's amazing that even in difficult marriages where there's intimacy not this is not all the time there's a thousand ways this can go wrong but but intimacy can often constantly reset the challenges of the marriage it constantly reset, and then they come back together and find find that bond they return to each other and and find a find a ticket because it's bringing bringing them back together in, in their das it's bringing them back together from the negativity or from the darkness from the rejection from the holding grudges it brings them back together to to unify in their consciousness it's very very profound the relationship between intimacy between your soy and between das and consciousness fine fine okay let's quickly see what's happening here so that was a kind of long answer to that kind of a question but here we are anyway um i lost the chat box here is the chat box no that's a disaster here it is there okay so here we go fascinating deep insightful with you taking it all in Ricky says, insightful, illuminating, appreciating all of it. I have the same questions as Malka, intense. I have with his it makes sense and has me in deep thought. Aviva says, with you, interesting. Like to see this connection between Das and Yasoid. Um, Courtney says, very interesting. How what we bond with psychologically, emotionally, idea-wise, express, and is drawn down through how we bond intimately at a physical level. Fine, fine, fine. Lots of comments here. Any questions, further questions, clarifications? Just a very basic question. When you said Lashon HaKodesh, you said Da'at and Yesod are synonyms, sort of. You sort of said that. You said they're... They're the same word, Yoda. And, and Yesod? So Yoda, Yoda, at a new Eve, it right. means he had physical intimacy with her. So the word for Das is the same as the word physical intimacy done with the done with your soy that's what i'm just quoting from the Ziva show he said you said that the same thing okay but it's not the same letters it's not the same shoresh it's not numerology it's just no it's it's, it's literally the same meaning the word das can mean physical intimacy right okay okay got it and it literally and it's also the word for consciousness okay thank you you're welcome Shifa. clarification yeah uh, similar to what Bracha was asking. So so both Yesod and Das function as the the one the element that takes everything before it and brings it together. Because you mentioned first it's that, that's the first Yisod. the first trait of it. It unites everything before, collects it, um, synthesizes it, and then it bonds with another and transmits it. Both of them do that. Yes, one same. does it in a level of consciousness and one does it in a level of physicality. Yeah. One does it within within the consciousness, within the being, within the parts of, and then that's what Das does within the parts of, and then Yusoi does it between the parts of and another parts of, between a person and another person. With my Das, mm -hmm. I can kind of say, what am I thinking? What are my beliefs? What am I feeling? What is my trauma? What is my joy? And try and bring that together. But I'm, I'm deciding that with myself. But with Yesoid, I'm I'm now leading others, or sharing others, or teaching others, or building relationships with others, and 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 giving over my ideas and my vision beyond myself. 
and connecting to others through that. Thank you. Also, um, this has me wondering about how well, you mentioned that the root of our trauma is in our DAS. So is the is the root of our healing in our DAS or in well, hang on. We, we, did, we did say the root of our trauma is in our DAS. You know, the root of our trauma is is in our midas. And the root of our trauma is in, in your soid, right? Das is the root of our healing. But if you if that what we said is that when you trauma affects our consciousness, so trauma shatters all of our consciousness. That's what trauma does. That's what fear does. That's what anger does. That's what lust does. It, it breaks and shatters and disrupts the normal functioning and flow of consciousness. So that's that's the part that we're speaking to. And das is the ticken of that. But that the reason you can't heal your own trauma is because the trauma is so confusing my consciousness that I don't have a self to heal the trauma, which is which is all the, the beginning of all spiritual awakening, the, 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 to find a self which is free of the trauma to be able to transform the trauma. Stick with us. I think you'll understand that, Nakuda, a little bit more as we go. Um, any other questions, my friends? Clarifications. Rob, I'll ask one quick question just related is um, without trying to put it tastefully, just what about elimination? The fact that elimination occurs in the same place is there, there's probably some deeper reason for the creation yeah, happening sure. there as well as elimination because there's sure. such opposites. Right. So that's, that's exactly the Nakuda of what we're speaking to, right? That there's different forces that can come out of this channel. There's different forces that come out of this channel. Do you use this? Does a person use this to, to create bonding and connection? You know, that the same channel beyond ourselves can channel out our garbage or can channel out our soul, to put it in, in the most simple way, right? And therefore, what do we choose to do with it? And when we channel our soul, do we channel it in the right direction or the wrong direction? Even when you're channeling your soul, you can give your, your light and your energy in the right place or the wrong place. Baby Nachman warns about teaching people teachings that are too deep for them, Kabbalah, that is too deep for them and they're not ready. And it can break them, it can hurt them. He actually says it's like spilling of seed. Right? So one is out of the same channels can come good and bad. And even out of the good, I can put the good in the right place and the good in the wrong place. So this is exactly an, on a simple, simple level. This is exactly what we're speaking to. Okay, any other questions or clarifications? So fine. He shows me this is who that's why the word Hadam Yoda it Khava the Isla Yoda there Omina Pagamim how you do in Rahman al Islam Nifkam Moya Khadas. Okay. When a person does the Pagam Hayadua, the Pagam Hayadua, the, the famous blemish means the spilling of seed. Means the spilling of seed. When a person spills their seeds, what does it mean spill their seeds? It means channeling the seed, not, not in a holy way, not, in a, not within the body of, of a partner the person is completely spiritually, physically committed to, done with consciousness, done with love, done with affection. If, if, if secular Jews, if not just knew the halachas around intimacy, from a Torah perspective, they would be blown away, blown away. People always think the religious people, the Hasidim, the men are so abusive to their women in intimacy, it's so dogmatic and holds in sheets. If you only knew the halachas of, of how much care, of how much love, of how much consideration, that he has to speak words of love to her, everything has to be done, you know, consciously and with consent and it's just like, it's so beautiful and it's so sensitive and it's so thousands of years ahead and still ahead. It's just unbelievably profound. So when a person arouses their, their lust, not 
because of their partner with the partner there in the context of, of, of a relationship and connection, number one, and then channels the seed outside of that, especially to nothing. Is it even worse? A lot of it's even a discussion. Is it worse to, is it worse to spill seeds nowhere? Or is it worse to do that with a partner who isn't your wife or a partner who isn't Jewish, non-Jewish? These, these are all like, each one of them is profoundly weird and scary, all these kind of ideas. Someone who isn't your soulmate, someone who isn't aligned with you. Now, I'm sorry for talking about these things, but occasionally, once every 10 years, <laughs> these, are, these are very important things. The Pagam HaYidua, this blemish, causes tremendous challenges to a person's consciousness. Nifgames daito shall adam venase it takes away a person's yeshiva das. I bet you'd ever learned this in uh, your mindfulness, mindfulness app. I bet they never said that you'll find it harder to have mindfulness and meditate because of spilling of seeds. But this is well known in our tradition. So it shatters the stillness of mind, the peacefulness of mind, the access to the equanimous self, the ability to watch my thoughts and let them pass and release and dissipate and enter a calm, open, relaxed, present state of mind. The more a person spills their seed, the less presence of mind that they have, yisha padas, the settling of mind, the returning to mind, the mindful state. Let's talk about the connection between the two. Number one. Number one, let's just start with the most obvious things before we say more mystically inclined things. There's no power of drawing. Ask any person in marketing and advertising. There's no greater, easier way to get a person's attention than sexuality a pr pretty woman on the car, you know, so a handsome man, you know, on the beach, come to our, uh, uh, you know, resort, whatever it is, our toothpaste, whatever it is, there's nothing that draws us more. There's no pleasure. The pleasure of intimacy is twofold. It's physically pleasurable and it's a sense of bonding and connection. And there's no greater desire than bonding. The, the greatest of all the mitzvahs is the vacus of bonding with the divine. And therefore, the greatest pleasure of the physical is the bonding with the other, right? So the, 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 the pleasure of, 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 of sexual intimacy is the bonding with the perfection, imperfection with another. It's taking all the person's energy and uniting it completely with another. And even though fear motivates us, and even though pleasure for food overrates us. And even though pleasure for ego, so that people should validate my ego motivates us, there's no force that motivates us more than sexual pleasure. Now, again, every individual has their own chicken. You may say sexual reality is not a big thing for me, but overeating is a thing for me. You may say, uh, you know, the biggest motivator for me is fear, fear of rejection, right? So we all, of course, have their own journey. But the Gadol, we see for all of humanity, this kind of taiva is the most powerful, is the most forceful. And when a person gets used to this pagam, this blemish, what does this blemish involve? Things I don't want to say, but especially when the internet is freely available and people can see these kind of things all the time. There are many scientists and researchers today that talk about I don't like to say the word P-O-R-N-O, etc. They talk about how shattering that is in consciousness. I, I've seen some of the videos recently of certain researchers talking about how damaging that is, not just damaging the relationship that the person's in, because then they're always projecting their fantasies onto the, the person and they're destroying them. Um, and they're destroying the relationship, and destroying the dynamic. But, but what it does is it, it takes a part of your brain and it creates a whole reality pleasure-seeking bubble that I don't have to be in a relationship, I don't have to, to invest anything on caring of another, sensitivity of another, I'm creating a whole dimion, a whole dimion bubble of delusion. And I'm, it's, it's, 
self-cycling towards just arousing, creating fantasy, and the amount of 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 chemicals in the brain that that releases, and the pleasure is so overwhelming that I'm conditioning myself like a monkey to take all my mental resources and focus them on that and the pleasure of that and the association with that, which consumes a person's being. If you ever work with addicts in this field, it entirely consumes their mind and all the relationship because there's such an impulse, there's such a pleasure, there's such a bonding, and it becomes more and more disconnected from actual life and actual real world and actual relationships. That it, and it's so powerful. The emotive pleasure centers of it are so powerful that it shatters the consciousness more than anything because it's so powerful. It's like it's like we're not worried about what you know the 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 dark governments of the world are going to do with solar power. Nobody's saying up all, all, all night saying, "What if Iran gets access to solar power?" You understand? It's not overwhelming the the Mossad right now. But if Iran gets nuclear power. Sexuality is the nuclear power of the, of, of the mind. Freud was not right on a lot of things, but in this Nakuna, he, he wasn't off. So, with that in mind, my friends, the first thing you have to understand is when a person starts focusing on this, it can consume because it's so powerful, it can really shatter. And, and you don't have to take the most extreme example of that to understand that. The smallest example, the little engagement in that, the fantasy of it, the self-fulfilling fantasy, the self-fulfilling, if you understand what I'm saying, that I don't have to have the maturity, the maturity to say that there is pleasure and the pleasure is is explored and in the and and achieved in a mutual way in the context of relationship and commitment and respect. And, and connecting to a person's soul and the essence of who they are, you understand? What, what, what does that mean? It means that when, when a couple are in a relationship and they both, they should want the pleasure, that's a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah in the Torah to have the physical relationship, even if you're not able to have children right now, because the love and the connection and the depth of the relationship, the unity is a mitzvah into itself, amazing idea, so wonderful. So, but the maturity between an adolescent minds exploring this energy, and a mature spiritually developed being is that the pleasure is there and the the, the expression of, of pleasure is there and not just mutual expression of pleasure, but the mutual expression of pleasure is elevated to the depth and the meaning of the soul of the connection, that there's no difference. It's tamming. This is the secret. It's, it's not we're doing a physical pleasure thing and now we come back to the emotional, spiritual part of the relationship. Is They are all one and unified together. And that transforms the sexual desire. It transforms the parts of the brain which one animal desires and want to close down consciousness and responsibility. Let's get drunk and then go out and pick up girls or, or guys, right? What does it mean? It means I don't want any of the spiritual, emotional relationship responsibility. It means I want to isolate my higher consciousness from my lower consciousness consciousness and pursue pleasure only. So the, 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 the physical pleasure in the context of love and marriage and commitment of sanctity, of holiness, elevates the physical pleasure centers up and integrates them with, with centers of deeper meaning and connection. That's a tikkun. That's a trauma therapy. Because Avoda Zara and trauma are all the same property that this desire is the only reality and everything else I ignore, negate, shatter, don't listen to. Fine. So first of all, what he's saying is this pagam, the blemish of spilling seed and the obsession around that, the thoughts around that, you know, it's, it's forbidden halakhically to think of another person when a person's with their husband or wife. It's forbidden halakhically. And the Kabbalists say that can distort the soul of the child that's conceived from that, that, that action because of that. Because it's not just they're physically together, it's they're supposed to be together physically, emotionally, and in mind, heart, and soul. And that's, that's, the, that's the unified, elevated union that they're aiming for. Sophie says, neurobiology, when neurons are connected, they fire together to pass on messages. What fires together, wires together, as, as is the famous saying. Literally, you're hardwiring your brain, and when it happens in survival and physical part, the hardwire is consuming thoughts and literally creating neural pathways in your physical brain, exactly. That's all on the body physical level, then add on consciousness level, and wow, how impactful. That's exactly what we're saying. Great. 
Sophie, just come up and say those things. Don't mind these things. Great. Now, so first of all, we see that this pagam, this obsession with sexual desire and the distortion of that, to take it out, I don't want to say the things that the person sees in this world, that the male fantasy which women want to become to get men addicted to these things is distorting all of womanhood in the world. That means the male vision charged with the pleasure centers of what a woman can and should look like and act like is so disconnected to what a loving, caring relationship, mature relationship can be and should be, that every time, one time a person does that and those associations are built, those, those castles of false demureness, it shatters that person's capacity to connect to another in a pure relationship to see the soul before the body. Only when you see the soul before the body can the body be integrated in the context of the soul and desire be integrated in the context of your soul. Fine. So that's number one. Number two is, So in the first, uh, the, 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 the pursuit of pleasure and the pursuit of that desire and the over-concentration of that and the distortion of that in a self-fulfilling way that doesn't require relationship or connection or love or respect or discipline shatters the consciousness. Even done one time in a small way, shatters the consciousness, corrupts the death. Two, energetically. When a person, when a man is thinking about that pleasure and thinking about that desire and thinking about those associations and thinking about those visualizations and thinking about that film and thinking about that fantasy ideal woman, what are they connected to in consciousness? What are you binding with? And not just thinking and doing it. What are you binding with? What are you binding with energetically? And the answer is a word we don't like to say, but it is the, the Kabbalistic root of this, L-I-L-I-T-H. It's the root of the darkest energy in the world. Why some New Age Jewish women have wanted to reclaim this name. It's nothing to reclaim. It's nothing that serves them. I spent the last three years sick in bed and my level of ability to learn Torah and daven properly is just like dropped. And I feel every day the hardest thing for me so far from what it's like to get up and daven and what it's like to with, with for hours properly and to learn properly and to learn to do it properly and the energy, the light you feel connected to. And many people tell me the feeling of when you're learning in your shivers for many years and you feel living Shivdi Bebeis Hashem, call you Mechai, I just want to sit with Hashem learning. And then you get thrown back. Now I have to get a job and I have to be in New York and I have to be Los Angeles. And what it feels like when you're learning Torah and then you have to go and work and I have to go and Shaduchim and I give out to my head and you feel that lack of holiness. You feel that lack of presence of mind. And you're, you're in the bilbulim of the world, right? Because it's not just the work and it's not just the stress and it's not just the internet and it's not just the smartphone. Is that when you're thinking about the stock market and when you're thinking about sexuality in an all consuming, destructive kind of way, or in a lustful, destructive kind of way, and you're thinking about does everybody love me and how many likes do I have? And you're thinking about, I hate what my person did to me when I was four years old. You are tapping into the dark energetic forces around that and they are drawing you over the cliff into darkness. And when we, we pull our mind back to Kedusha, to Torah, to Tefillah, to, to avoid us Hashem, to meditation, to Devakus, then we are reconnecting with tremendous light. So when a person is thinking about lustful thoughts in an obsessive way, small or large, and they let their mind go there more and more, at the energetic root of that place, is a voice that says, I'm gonna seduce you to suck all of your energy and life force out of you. That means physically, that means I'm gonna take all your creativity and joy and love and your creative gifts, and I'm gonna suck them out of you and run them into the ground. This is the opposite of Kedusha, where Hashem says, I want to reveal your light, 
Let's say to have uh, tell you something horrific. <laughs> the force of Kedusha says, I want to tap into your greatest light and I want to reveal it in the world. The force of darkness says what? It doesn't say you want to conceal your light. It says I want to tap your holiness and your vision and your gifts, and I want to use them for darkness. That's worse than being blocked. Worse than being blocked. I'm going to take your money and I'm going to make you invest it in the worst, dumbest things in the world. I'm going to take your creativity. I'm going to put you, make you CEO of a company where all your creativity is used just to create destructive, terrible things. I'm going to take your, per, your personal skills, your people skills, and rather make the world a better place, innovate, a, develop a social media app and, and uh, rip people's lives apart, right? Like Twitter. So the, the worst force in the world is not, I'm going to block you from achieving your goals. I'm going to take all that you have, and I'm going to channel that towards destructive nature. And that's what spilling of seed is. It's the most destructive force in the world that says, I'm going to get you all excited to the point where you will pour your energy into nothingness. And without going into the darkest of it, when we use sexual energy towards nothing, it doesn't go to nothing. It takes the life force and the consciousness which is in those cells and in that seed, and it gives birth to darkness and forces on the outside of us. And the Siddiquim say that when people spill their seed or any of their creative energy, I'm saying that literal state of energy, meaning seed, and metaphorical energetic, that when we use all our energies, Rabbi Nachman says if you teach people Torah, what they can't understand, it's also a spilling of seed. That, that means it crushes them, it overwhelms them, it confuses them. It creates children, but the children are, are deformed and distorted energetically. All of our seed has the potential for life. And when it does not get channeled in the right direction, it creates dark forces that literally are around us energetically, that overwhelm us, that distort us. Um, there's many people who I know who have issues pulling a seed and they suffer from depression. They suffer from anger. And it's a very, very intense thing uh, because it affects them energetically. There's dark forces around them. You don't have to be superstitious about that. You can see depression and anger and all kinds of trauma that's connected to people who become obsessed with this, this kind of stuff and how, how it fractures them. So the first thing we're saying is what it does, the neuroscience of it and the neurobiology of it, how it fractures the consciousness because it's so powerful. And the second thing we're saying is not just the psychology of it, not just the neuroscience of it, but we're talking about energetically, spiritually, what it does to a person which is why you can imagine if a person could heal that, then they reclaim all of their consciousness. And it's also a relationship, any relationship. And by the way, the mystics say in Chas to misunderstand this, that Yesoid is not just intimacy. Yesoid is what a teacher uses to teach children because uh, and, and, or a teacher, a Rebbe uses to teach Talmudim because the Rebbe is doing that with Das. This is what our famous argument about if, if a, if, if, if a person, this is a very deep thing, I'm, I'm not sure I can explain this clearly. There's a, there's a fascinating halakha that a lot of people get upset about. It's already a Gemara. That if a person's walking past a stream and they see their father drowning and their Rebbe drowning, who should they save? Who should they save first? The answer is they should save me. You should save me. That's the end of the Torah. Thank you very much. I don't care about halakha. I'm drowning in the water. Help me out. Give your whole class once. Fine. The answer is you should save the Rebbe. Now remember, Kibbut Av Ve'em is honoring your mother and father is one of the top five of all the mitzvahs. And this is a very deep thing. But the core of it is what we're saying. Because the Rebbe births you with Das, with your consciousness. The Father just births you with your body. But you could be in the soul, but unconscious, not alive. The language of our sages is, is that the father births you in this world, that the baby births you into the next world. But what that means in a deeper way, if you don't understand it, how beautiful and profound it is, my friends, how beautiful and profound it is, is that we can be in this world, but unconscious. We can be live in this world, but uncircumcised, going after the desires of our heart, addicted to the destructive part of our ego nature, 
and our lusts and our fears and our trauma, they define us. But the Rebbe gives us our consciousness. The Rebbe gives us our das. And the das is the true self, the true nature. And in the end of the day, it's one thing to be alive, but it's another thing to be conscious. Isn't that profound? Isn't that profound? So the first thing we're saying is, hang on, I forgot something. Where was I up to? Got to start in the Nakuda. The first thing we're saying is, it fractures your mind and your delusion, your capacity for actual relationship, for depth, for mental sight, because you're taking the most powerful force and letting it self-fulfill itself. And then the second, you're, what you're doing to that is you're attaching to negative energy. You're creating negative forces and darkness. You're unleashing dark angels around you. Again, you can see that in a superstitious way. What you can see is that what you're putting out into the world is a life force. And when that life force is not given a holy vessel to receive it, which is the holy woman of the relationship, then it creates other forces receive it. Other forces want it. If you have a lot of money and you give that money to good, worthy causes, then they can build extraordinary things with that. And if you fund that money into dark causes with your power and energy, they build dark things with that. If you if you have a lot of love to give, a lot of caring, and you give that to a healthy man, a healthy woman, you could build a big, beautiful relationship. If you give that to a narcissist, if you give it to someone that wants to use you, they can suck your life force and energy out of you and 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 use your your kind and caring compassion to destroy you and them and the world, right? So if you have ideas, so, so everything you have can be drawn out of you for good or drawn out of you for darkness. And all of this shatters your mind. It shatters you usually for that. So it shatters your health, shatters your emotions, shatters your consciousness. And when we, we work on our bris and we pure men, bris means the power to unify, sorry, the, the yasoi means the power to take all my energy and all that I've got. When I'm the boss of a company, I'm taking all my energy and all my vision, what I've got. When I build a family, I'm not even talking sexuality. You have a mother, you have a father. When you're a rebbe, you have students. I'm giving you students all that I've got, my creativity, my compassion, my sensitivity, my insight, I'm giving. We pour ourselves. Our mothers pour themselves into their children, right? We pour ourselves. I'm pouring myself into my startup. Right? I'm giving it my creativity. I'm giving it the most important commodity that I have is my attention, my attention. I'm pouring in my soul. And if I pour my attention consciously into something, I can create a new life, a new organization, a new company, a new startup, a new family, a new yeshiva, a new movement. Right? I can pour my energy in, or it can consume me and use me and drain everything out of me and use it all for darkness. And the more I'm thinking of those things, I'm pouring, collecting all that I have, all my ingenious, all my creativity, all my attention, all my structure, all my insight, all my vision, all my time, all my energy. That what it means to be a mother is just seeing her pour everything she is into her into her family, right? And then and then and then it's what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of that business and that startup and the stock market and Bitcoin and thinking about money and rich and fame and glory and ego. Then that's what I'm energetically attached to, and that's what's consuming me, and that's what wrecks me. When I'm thinking about I'm an influence on social media and what can I say that people will like me? What how can I look that people will love me? And how can I cut my my body into pieces and restructure it so it'll be more appealing, so I'll get more likes, so I'll redefine how people think it's beauty and people won't like normal people because they're like me and I'll be the focus. Right? So all I'm thinking is ego and darkness and ego and darkness. It's coming from hunger. It's expressing something which is just coming from, from pain and darkness and hunger and ego, and that's what I'm attracting to me. So the Tikkun HaKlali, all of these, my friends, this is what we're trying to say are the force of connection gone wrong. They're all the fallen forms of connection. If the main mitzvah is all of the Torah, says the Zohar, is the Vekas, is connection, then the most powerful yearning in the world is to connect. That's what social media gurus and filmmakers and pornography and, and making money, now that I've made all the money, everyone will love me and respect me. Connection. We're all running in different directions, trying to find different ways to connect, to connect to myself, to connect to others, connect to my partner, connected to my followers, connected to my source, 
right? Connecting to my tribe. Politically, I'm going to go red and not blue or blue and not blue because I feel connected when I vote with people like me and we laugh at everybody else because we're connected. The most powerful force in the world is connection. And when we connect in a holy way, we elevate the world and connect all the oilamas, all the sedish stauchlis, all is elevated and connected together. But we connect in a destructive way, then we channel all our forces into the pit. And that means we fund the dark side. <laughs> that means we fund the dark side. It means all the forces of Amalek and all the political darkness in the world and all the anti-religious darkness in the world and all the anti-spiritual darkness in the world and all the trauma of the world, the mystics will say, comes from the spilling of seed. That means, yes, literally the spilling of seed. In fact, the mystics go far to say that the main sin in the Garden of Eden was Adam actually spilled his seed. And the whole story of the tree is the snake trying to get the seed and Chava and the seed from them into his energy. Because the dark side is funded on the misdirection of energy from Kedusha. The clipper is Yoinik from Kedusha. Look at all your trauma, actual psychological trauma. All our trauma is strong parts of us, right? That are that are being channeled into darkness. It's something very, very deep to think about. All the trauma within us exists from a place of goodness, and it draws, it sucks on that goodness. I've told you before. If you look at any person's greatest challenge, it's a hint to their greatest strength because it's a misdirection of their greatest strength. Your, your darkness is a misdirection because the, the, the light funds the darkness, and that's called spilling of the seed. That's what it means on a deeper level. It means the forces of darkness want to suck our life force out of it, and they do that in many different ways. And all the dark things that happen in the world, I mean, sexual abuse, all forms of sexual abuse, sexual connection is the deepest, beautiful, most holy connection in the world. So the, to all, so much trauma comes from sexual abuse. So much trauma comes from anger. Anger comes from ego. And ego comes from a sense of self, right? So it misuses the sense of self. Power and control destroys most of the world, we know, in politics. But leadership and initiative of hum humans in the world comes from the capacity that we are impactful and we can make a difference in the world. Right, So all the forces of darkness are misusing and misdirecting, mischanneling, willfully mischanneling the forces of light. And that's what consumes us and depletes us and overwhelms us and steals away our consciousness until we can't get back to ourselves. We can't get back to our mind, to our heart, to our presence. So we're saying a lot. So, Aminapagamim, how you do them, and from this, this of spilling the seeds. Spilling the seed means literally spilling the seeds, and it means any time where more light is given that the vessel cannot hold it, which breaks the vessels, which sends the light out into the forces of darkness of the world. Like Manal Islam, Nifgam Moya Chadas, for Ali Deze Nifgam, Nifgames Daito, Shal Adam, Venase, Mibilbo, for Ainlo Yishavadas. And that takes away our, our das, our capacity to truly love, to truly connect, to truly be present, to truly be bonded. And even in holy moments, authentic moments of love and human connection, but and so addicted to pornography and darkness, that even if they have a spouse who's truly loving and present and wants intimacy, they just can't enter into that space with love and compassion and presence because they've shattered their capacity to connect. Many people I know, if I get out of sexuality, I've seen this a thousand times in my life, couples, relationships, the, 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 the woman can come and say, the man will say, the woman will say, our relationship's not working, it's so hard, it's so difficult. The man will be pulling out his hair. I'm like, I'm going, wow, the man must be abusive. And the man is honestly saying, I love her, I care for him, being so compassionate, I'm willing to give her anything, I'm willing to be more patient, more caring. And you're like, wow, he really is, what's wrong with her? And the girl will stop and say, I've told you about this before. I was abused when I was 15 years old. I had a terrible relationship when I was 22. And, and she's so stuck in the past, in the trauma of the past, that even in lofty, high, beautiful relationships, she can't bring herself to that because she poured herself into something else destructive 
until she's surrounded by that darkness, by that energy, call it psychological, call it neuro neuroscience, call it trauma, call it dark forces around her, whatever you want, and they're with her. And they're even in a moment of love and authentic connection and a man and a woman worthy of each other, beautiful intimacy in a holy way. They can't bring themselves, if you've ever seen so much trauma that, that, that people have to go through to have healthy sexual connections. Also in the Torah world, for sure in the secular world, Many people can't, in, a, in a beautiful, meaningful marriage can't be loving, can't be present, can't just be trusting of the other, to have the curiosity and, and presence of mind to get pleasure from intimacy because they've had so many destructive relationships. They can't trust themselves. They can't trust their body. They can't hear their body. They can't hear their needs. They can't give to another. They can't open and just lay back and open up to receive pleasure because all the defenses come up, all the triggers come up. They have no use of a They have no return to connection. You should have asked, the capacity to return to be present and trusting and connect because it's been shattered from something previous. And what he's talking about literally, he means that when a person has times of Masul, Yom Toivim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, of, of, of the Sukkah, of Pesach, of Man Chayvaseinu, of Shabbos Kodesh, of the Ravid, of Ravid, of the time when we are open, the times when the light, the Mokh and the Gadlis comes to us, we can't even feel spiritual connection then. When we come to the retreat, we can't get spiritual connection then. Why? Because, because the Pagama Bris. Because I've, Pagama Bris means I've, I've shattered and distorted and confused my power of connection. I've poured my energy into destructive things until I've so much bonded with them. I've bonded with my fear. I've gone around in my head for the last 20 years, what a failure I am, my low self-esteem, that I can't do anything, that I'll never amount to anything. And then I'm given a raise, or then I'm given a stage, and I'm given a, a beautiful moment where I make a big difference. And I still have in my head, I'm nothing, I'll never amount to anything, even this will be rejected, I'll never be enough. Even in a moment where everything opens and the truth is obvious, I'm so bound. I'm so connected to disconnection. That, and I'm, I'm able to connect. Hashem is right there in front of me. Hashem says, here's the land, Eretz Yisrael, it's a good land. I'm coming with you into the land. And we're like, no, we're all going to die there. It's going to be terrible. It's never going to work. Hashem's like, you're crying for nothing. I love you. I'm here from you. I brought you out of Egypt. You're going to abandon us. You're going to leave us behind. It's because of their trauma in Egypt, because of the trauma of what happened with the Nachashes and God Eden, that even when Hashem comes to them, in a moment of blessing and openness, I love you. Let me make love to you. Let us go and get married together and live in a beautiful home. I bought you a home. It's called Eretz Yisrael. We had intimacy at Har Sinai. I injected my neshama into you. All have an Efesh Elikis. I injected Torah into you. Nase Venishma, you said. I will marry you. I will do what you say. And we, 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 we shared one as one together. We had a ketubah. I gave you a wedding contract that was the Torah. I gave you the, the, the business yam stuff. I gave you money of kesef, of shtar, of beer. And then I said, now let's build a house together. I'm taking damage as well. And we were so traumatized from power. We were so traumatized from our previous relationship that we couldn't trust. And the Shem is still ready to love us. Ready to love us. He said, you're crying for no reason. You see this in relationships. Honey, we're together now. I love you. We're safe. No, but you know what I experienced before. Sometimes the woman's like, I love you. We'll do whatever we want to do together for pleasure. And the man's like, I can't see you because all I can see is this fantasy. You have to look like this. You have to dress like this. You have to say it like this. You have to act like this. And he never sees another person because he's fragmented. The desire lustful part of the brain is, is disconnected from the soul, from the consciousness. So he can't get back to connection. That is gullus. So your soid and das are deeply connected. Huh. When we pour our seed, when we pour our energy, our soul, our brilliance, our gifts, our consciousness into the other, then we lose our consciousness until we can't get back. And then we have to do a bris, a circumcision. We have to return to walking. Walking with Hashem means aligning with Hashem in all of my midas, aligning my Selim al below with the Selim Kim above. And then I could be Tamim. And Tamim means whole and unified. And what Tamim really means is there's no difference between body and soul. 
There's no difference between man and woman. There's no difference between and how because they are one and unified. There's no difference between za and nuk, between kudshe berichu or shchinte, between the shem and the, the shchina. The soid and the das unify. The das and the keti unifies. All of them unify with the malchus. And then I have yeshiva das. It's a settling of the consciousness. Shleimus das. Shalom doesn't just mean everything's not at war. It means everything is unified and wholesome unification within myself in relationship myself to the other. That's the bris. The bris is the stripping off the mila, the stripping off of the ola salev, of all the destructive expressions and associations of all the dark acts and all the energies surrounding them and returning and elevating and reintegrating those energies to true expansive divine consciousness so I can live with constant deep connection, complete presence, complete joy, open-hearted, trusting, unified, connecting. And that means Hashem appears to you because then there's nothing else to distort that. Tamim, tamim is kite, ain't on Mulvade. Ain't on Mulvade, before there was a man and woman trying to connect, a head and a cart trying to get, a Rebbe and a student trying to connect, a vision and a manifestation at odds. But now, ain't on Mulvade, there's vision and there's expression and there's everything is only one because now they are complete expressions unified with each other because you took off the skin, the layer, the clipper that separated between the two. You took it off your body, you took it off your heart, you removed that destructive part of the, of the neural networks, you remove those associations. So you just look at another and you already see the vision manifest. So that was only the first four lines in the Sivir Shalom. There was two more paragraphs, but we'll get there one day. Let's quickly check in. Hi. If everyone wants to look when they're talking, look about Adam spilling the seed and the snake trying to retrieve it. So that's all of Kabbalah. That's in the Kit Beri and other sources. This is an emotional check in. Let me take questions, comments. Sandra says, wow, wow, wow. Connie says, I've learned to receive so many new ideas today. Thank you, Rip Katz. Very good stuff. Amen. Beautiful learning. So I think we should continue this tour next week and see what he says about Adam Avino. See how he brings it down about the consequence of, of doing this tippin. Any questions or comments? Shalom, Rav. Shalom, Yehuda. Um, so, I mean, you were saying that Yesod affects uh, our dot, right? Um, and it's because, you know, what, what's down here affects the above. So obviously what's above up can affect the below as well. Does that also imply that? So for instance, if, if a person, you know, chooses to not use their dot, right? Or once in a while chooses to zone out of their dot by distracting themselves with uh, whatever it is, you know, just junk, not even necessarily anything related to, to um, erva, but just something, you know, junk for the brain. Then essentially that distraction we're doing is a, it's, is a of the, it's also like a spilling of the seed in the mind, right? Well, where, where, the, the, as the Balatanya says, there's no, nothing neutral in this world. You're either putting your conscious, investing consciousness in Kedusha or investing in nothing at all. Let's say I go online on Facebook and I hang out for 20 minutes and I see who's, what someone had for lunch today and what recipe they're having and somebody got this thing and that thing and somebody's angry with someone. So I'm connecting to something. I'm never connecting to nothing. I'm connecting to someone's ego, to someone's pain, to somebody's, you know. So you're always connecting to something. There's no neutral. It's important to understand it that way. I see. So, so I mean, essentially, the, the, the reason this kind of like um, weighs heavy or feels like it weighs heavy is because the concept of constantly putting our consciousness on, on, um, on focused Kadusha 
I mean, first of all, like I can imagine how like a set or like a, like a, like a, like a strict way of doing things throughout your day can really help you get to that objective. Right. Because if you have like, you know, morning to feel like here and then learning here, and then when you enter business, you have very specific tasks that you're doing, but of course life throws us curves balls. Right. And there's times in life where everything gets kind of like open and, you know, so, so my, my, my question, my real question is this is, when when we're thrown out of that, right? When we're thrown out of it for one of life's challenges or whatever it might be, does that also have an effect on our on our yesod? Does it also so like, the, the, trickle the, down? The, the, no? the simple answer to your question is the simple answer to your question is the ideal is that we're always focusing on kedusha and never anything else. And even if to make money, when I'm going out in the world to make money to be practical, all of that's kedusha as well. I'm channeling forces. I'm doing guru. I'm keeping the halakas in the business. So everything we kedusha. That's number one. That's an ideal. Number two is being practical in, in the world that we live in. Torah is kind enough to divide things into three categories and not two, despite the fact that the middle of Chassidus, the Tanya wants to say there's really only two, and that is the area of, of mitzvah and of veira and rishus. There's the area of, of holiness. When I'm learning to her, when I'm davening, when I'm helping another person, when I'm doing a chesed in the world, etc., that's that's wonderful. That's holiness. And then there's a veira. There's things which are halakhically forbidden, and they're not just because the rabbis say don't do this. It's because if you could tap into what's happening in the energetic fields around you, you'd realize the destructive nature of that. And then there is an area called rishus. The area called rishus is something that is neutral and is okay. And ideally, we want to try and do good in there. And if we chill out and watch a sports game, do I watch sports games? No. Is it the worst thing in the world? No, it is the worst thing in the world where you think all your time and energy should be winning the game and the greatest moments of your life in the game and the worst moments of your life when you lost and you're willing to kill a guy because you voted for the other team. So that's a disaster, right? But if it's just something neutral, you enjoy a game of basketball, you like to go for walking in the forest, I think that's holy. Fine, that's already Kedusha. But, but there are areas there's neutral and fine. And of course, everything that we're putting our conscious on, whether it's holy or terrible, or neutral, that of course is affecting our yesoid because they are all forms of connection, right? They're all forms, am I connecting to the workplace? You know, at, like go and watch a sports game, but with all your energy and all, if you're that guy that when the umpire, you call it the umpire, I don't know what you call it in, in America, when he, you know, you know, you win the game, you lose the game. Great, I enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the team, see, uh, the, the skill, I enjoyed the unity of, the, of it all. But if you start screaming the umpire when he makes a bad call, right, and you're just furious about it, you know, you're one of those guys that starts throwing things at them, then, then your yesoid is getting messed up because you're investing, you're pouring too much in that thing. And it's out of context with who you really are. It's out of context. So anything that you become addicted to, and I use addiction in a very loose term, like everybody's addicted to their smartphone for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a problem with your soid. It's a tick and cloudy because you're pouring your energy into that thing more than its absolute value. And some guy's in your shiver and he says, Rabbi, I don't like learning a all day. I like going to play basketball, shooting some hoops. Fantastic, that's awesome for you. That's awesome for you. Use your body. Use another skill set, use another part of your mind, come back stronger, cleaner, fantastic. I want to a bit of, I like to paint, I like to dance, fantastic, paint, dance, get up. But when those things start to consume you and take you over, that's the only thing you want to do in the world, right? That person that I, I so much want to be a famous dancer, famous thing, I don't spend any time with my family, friends, I don't do anything else in my life, is because I'm just pursuing that goal to the point of destroying all the other parts of my consciousness and being. So, relatively speaking, that's a mistake in das that goes to a mistake of your soid, that I'm pouring my energy too much in a destructive way into something that I, I can't break that or, or come back. So relatively speaking, yes, they're all connected. May I ask a question? One, one second, okay. Um, just raise hands if people have any more questions or comments before we end. Um, let's go to Ricky, then to your Yochevet. Thanks again, Rob. So my question is really just about and maybe you'll get to this. So if you if you will, then we can talk about it some other time. But you know, why is this the the, the main energy, the prime correction? Why is it not something else? And related, why is it so concealed? Why are the forces that we that shall not be named so prevalent in the world? There's there's all of this that surrounds us in the world. It seems like it's all by design because this wisdom, when you hear it, 
it sounds so that there's an obviousness to it. There's a, a, a realness and a connection that you, at least I have, I'm sure everybody else on the, on the, the zoom does, but where, you know, Jews are 0.2% of the world. So it's so concealed by design, by Hashem, by well, God. The why? first part of the question I got, what, the second part of the question, what's concealed? Why, why is the, the wisdom, the, the connection of this, the being able to, to Fine, live in this good. manner is so concealed? Okay, so then the, uh, to answer your question is, and maybe we'll do a whole class on the, these two questions, okay? But the al so on one foot. All of Kabbalah, and that means all of reality, is structured on the dynamic of the relationship between masculine and feminine, of a dual nature of opposites that unite together, or do they not unite together? That's every love story in history. That's why Shira Shirim is the Song of Songs, is the Holy of Holy, because it tells the story of a man and woman who are separated and united. That's why all the most popular songs and all the most popular stories are love stories, because we sense at our core that that dynamic between masculine and feminine is the core between head and heart, between body and soul, between the spiritual world and physical, between God and Klai Yisrael. These are the core between a person's potential and their actual. This is this is between the vision and the manifestation of the vision. This is the deepest subject in all of reality. I, it's been a while since I taught a male-female course, and I'd like to make a video series of that and release that soon. I'd like to tour that in America. I'd like to come back to these subjects. There's there's no subject that that touches us more than relationships. That's the core of it. And all of Kabbalah is all about the yichuv of kutsha b'richu shkintei, the feminine and masculine divine energies and their fragmentation and disconnection to each other, and then they return to each other. And the base of Migdash is the, ha the house, which is the place where heaven and earth kiss, the kissing of the masculine and feminine. And if you learn all of Kabbalah, it's all about yichudim of the higher world and the lower world, the world above, below, the parts of the love below. So this is the core subject of all the reality. And everything is basically about there's a giver and a receiver and they are separated and they then try and return to come back together as one. And there's no more deep and singular unifying theme of all reality than that. And there's nothing that breaks us more than a broken relationship. And there's no greater plague in this world than, than a relationship that works, masculine and feminine. Yes, masculine and feminine. Yes, I said it, masculine and feminine. And with that in mind, without criticism, without judgment, it's just a deep truth that you see. Why is this subject so concealed? It's so concealed because, well, first of all, it's not concealed because it's everywhere all the time. And sexuality is everywhere all the time and it's overwhelming our senses everywhere all the time. So it's everywhere all the time. But it's concealed because it's so misused, because it's so mischanneled that there's a balance of that it's everywhere all the time and overwhelming and destroying us. And then there's a counterbalance, which is you have to be sneers about it because the forces in this world attach to that and misuse it. There are people that are furious that I would ever speak about these things, right? Because in the in the world, there's, there's a certain Adam Goddard who was very, very well known, a, a, a massive Talmud Fahim into Kabbalah, who taught so many of the teachers of the last generation. And, and so many Rabbanim that I knew thought he was the, the God of the door, in a shkaf at least, and would go to him, ask questions. And this one time I went to him when I was starting to teach and I was having an unusual impact and reach a lot of people. And I wanted to do a series of classes and, and take publicly and lead with them about relationships. Um, and I just thought it would be a revolution. When I taught a certain series that I did, so many people came. And I thought we should make a film about this and take a big. And my rabbi, rabbis at the time said I should go and ask him his permission. He would help it and do it. And I told about him and I just said, like, we could we could teach about the capitalistic model of male female dynamics. And it would it would get millions of views. And here's how we're going to do it. And here's the curriculum. And he just looked at it and he basically he said no. And I was like, just shell shocked. And I was like, in the most humble way, I was trying to say, what the heck, you, why, why, the, where would you possibly, like he's the god and I'm no one, but I just felt that the core of my being was wrong. And he said that it, it was never been our way to talk about these things publicly. And I was just astonished that he said that. I was like, 
it's not a question of talking about it publicly. It's a question of everybody in the world's talking about it all the time anyway. But at least we can bring Torah wisdom to it. At least we can bring Kedusha to it. At least we can elevate it. And he just felt absolutely not. Now, I tell you with all my heart, I'm happy to stand before Hashem and say, I think he's 100% wrong. But the sensitivity that he has is because there's too much darkness around us. He's not wrong on the concern. He's not wrong on the fact that you wouldn't be blown up in 20 different ways if you tried it. Because there's so much darkness around sexuality. Even to talk about it in a Torah class with Kedusha, there's still people that in their mind, they will drag that in the wrong way. And, and there's a lot of, I'm not just talking about psychologically, spiritually, there's a lot of darkness around that you have to be careful of. So in one way, you have to be Magala Tefa, you have to reveal a little bit, you have to conceal a little bit, but I do think we have to talk about more about these subjects. If you're a rabbi that starts talking about these subjects, people would ban you, you'd never be able to speak publicly again. So, because because of the wall of protection around it, and I, I think it's just it's a very challenging thing. But there's much that needs to be said on it. Also, my friend, there's just a lot of people that don't want to hear this stuff. Tell me the cool meditation stuff. Don't tell me I can't express my desires how I want to express my desires. And before we get into the before we get into the LGBT and all that deep complexity, right, which is also bound to the subjects. Now, there's a whole group of people that that. This is even more sensitive subject to, and we have to be careful. There's a lot of religious people that just pile up on those people without any depth or sensitivity or caring. And I think there's a lot more nuance and sensitivity that, that could be brought to this table to explore that with. So there's a lot of things, at least compassion, at least compassion. So because of its power, because of its power, there must be caution. That's what we're saying. My friends, we're super out of time. I hope that was interesting for you. I'd love to hear on workplace the three takeaways. Can we can we com complete this class next week? Can we continue one more with your permission? Great. So we'll finish the the Siva Shalom says on that path. May we be circling the Siva Shalom, the paths of Shalom, of Shlemus, of 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 bringing all these things together and uniting them together in the deeper sense. That's the path that the Shem should appear to us and we should live with them constantly. Amen. Can you hear that, son? Psychos, and have a good week to be continued.